Welcome to the expert stage. Um, I'll give everyone another second to actually sit down. I hope you all had a cappuccino or two this morning, pretty early on a Monday. Um, so, this dialogue, this panel is going to be about a modern framework for e-commerce and content. And as I just said before on the center stage, that sounds pretty decent. And when I first digged into the topic, I realized it's going to be actually pretty controversial. It's not an easy topic to solve since there is a lot of different perspective on it, perspectives on it. President of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, um, said in the guidelines for his time at the European Commission in July 2014, he said, I believe that we must make much better use of the great opportunities offered by digital technologies with no, no borders. Which is true, since technologies do not know borders, um, but the humans using those technologies are still faced with a lot of borders. And this is what we want to talk about today. It's fiscal borders, it's um, challenges around copyright legislation, it's about um, a lot of different infrastructure uh, troubles. Uh, and it's about, we're still a geographical region, and even though technology jumps over every water and every border and bridges every gap, it's still difficult for us as Europeans to do the very same. So for today, we invited um, four different perspectives, and I hope we're gonna discuss the topic a little controversial, making sure that we understand every different perspective and viewpoint on it. First of all, let's start with the lady we have here. Uh, we have Marlene. She's Secretary General at E-Commerce Europe. So she's going to represent um, the seller's perspective. E-Commerce Europe is a European umbrella organization representing a whole lot, more than 25,000 different companies that sell goods and services online. She has a background in political science and uh, has massive experience in translating issues into um, policies and agendas and help implementing them. So she will be representing the point of view that those that sell goods and services on the internet have. Then we have um, David Martin here. He's senior legal officer at the BEUC. Um, it's the European cons Consumer Organization. So it's kind of the counterpart to what Malena does. Um, he's representing the consumers, basically us when we buy on the internet. Um, and you all know what we face, which problems we often face as consumers. That is not only sometimes we do not have access or not the possibility to shop at web shops from other <coughs> European countries, or we have to um, face the problem of roaming fees and so on. Um, he, he has a, a, a master's degree in European law, and um, I realized if you do something in the European Commission you, and around Europe, you yeah, obviously have a degree in law. <laughs> Which has also Dr. Philip Runge. He's policy officer at the European Commission. Um, he's been working at the European Commission since 2009, so he really dig deep into the topic, first with audiovisual media policy and now copyright. So he will be representing the perspective of the one that tries to shape the agenda to make a single digital market possible. And um, last but not least, we have Stefan Sporn, Professor Dr. Stefan Sporn. He's general manager at the, um, the RTL International for uh, international distribution. So he's representing basically the perspective of creative content producers and distributors. Uh, he's also attorney at law, so another lawyer here. Um, and tiny little thing I thought was interesting, he used to be a journalist, so a kind of creative content producer himself, and he will be representing the, the topic around copyright. So, um, I asked all of you to basically make the, help you as audience to understand the different perspectives. I asked all of you to um, give us a little viewpoint on your perspective on the topic of a single digital market. Um, 
the other way around, digital single market it's called. And um, I would like um, David to start with his presentation of his viewpoint. Thank you very much for, for the kind introduction. I, I would like to talk about the barriers that consumers are facing when they try to shop online or access uh, online services. Uh, because it's true that the digital single market and digital technology offer enormous possibilities for consumers, but the way this is working today, consumers are not able to enjoy and benefit fully from, from these uh, possibilities offered by the single market. And this is because there's artificial barriers that are created online. And I'm talking about <coughs> barriers which often do not exist anymore in the, in the physical world. For example, I'm, I'm Spanish, I live in, in Belgium. If I go to a shop here in Hanover today, nobody's going to say, well, I'm not going to sell you this product that you want to buy because you're Spanish or because you don't live here. If I go to that very same shop uh, online, this might not be the case. I might, be, I might not be able to buy what I want to buy. So this is because of what we call geo-blocking, uh, these practices to block consumers trying to access certain services from outside the country where the shop is based or outside where the consumers are based. And it, it has, a, from a legal perspective, it has two angles. One is the e-commerce angle when you try to buy a, a physical good, for example. And the other one is the audiovisual or copyright uh, angle when you're trying to access content. In terms of the e-commerce part, basically what we see from a consumer perspective are four different issues. First is what we call refusal to sell, where you try to buy something and the shop wouldn't sell it to you because of where you're based or because of your nationality. Second thing is a refusal to deliver. You would be able to buy what you want to buy, but they would not ship it to where you live. The third thing is uh, rerouting. You might be rerouted to your own um, country. Basically, if the company has two different websites, one for Germany, one for Belgium, I would be sent automatically to the Belgian website, which might not have the same product, might have different prices. And the third one is, uh, and sorry, the fourth one is uh, price discrimination. The, the, they might charge me a different price because of uh, where I live or because of my nationality again. And I, first thing that we need to keep in mind is that EU law forbids this kind of discrimination. It can be justified under certain reasons, but right now, the way things are, those reasons are not clear enough. And uh, we see that there's a widespread discrimination that is not uh, working to the benefit of consumers. And this needs to be tackled, in our opinion. The other part is the part about uh, copyrighted content, audiovisual content. I'm sure we've all seen that uh, message when we try to see a video that says, this content is not available in your country. Uh, this is because of the way copyright and licensing of content works which uh, we believe is out of date in an online world, and its consumers are paying the price. So we believe that uh, it, this kind of geo-blocking also for the visual content is it's, uh, preventing consumers from accessing uh, a wider choice of, of content, and it's, uh, it's not good for them. And it generates frustration, for example, in my country, um, the type of offer, I, I might not be able, I might not be happy with the TV local offer I have mm. or the online audiovisual platforms available in my country, and I might look elsewhere, but I'm not going to be able to do it. So it's a, it's a problem for consumers, and it's also restricting competition, in, in, our, in our opinion. And we believe that in a digital world, these barriers have no, no place. And we are very happy that the Commission is trying to tackle all this in the digital single market. So we are looking forward to the next steps. And I'll just leave it there for the moment. Thank you very much. I think we all, like as consumers, are aware of uh, what we just heard. We all experienced this. Um, I don't know if any of you have a web shop or um, tried to have one, have, has a private one, or owns or runs a company that sells goods or services on the <coughs> internet. Um, those of us might have a little different view on what consumers think is unfair, and I would really like to hear Marlene's take on um, 
e the e-commerce part. Yeah, thank you very much also for having me. Um, well, as said, I'm uh, representing um, 25,000 web shops uh, throughout Europe. And um, however, we expect a double digit growth rate that will uh, continue with 11%. Um, we still see plenty of opportunities for growth. Um, because we also have um, main barriers. We conducted the survey amongst our members and we have a top three. And uh, first of all, it's about legal fragmentation. So all these different sets of rules concerning consumer and contract law, but also on data privacy. Um, the second one is um, about uh, the different taxation systems and uh, customs and, uh, of course, VAT. And the third one, which is a really big barrier to go across border, is um, actually about distribution and e-logistics. Um, so today, only 15% of consumers actually buy in another member state. And 38% of consumers <coughs> actually do feel confident about their purchase. So in our opinion, um, it's not only by tackle, tackling these barriers, but also boosting the trust uh, within uh, the consumer, within e-commerce. Um, but back to the discussion today, it's, uh, it's about geo-blocking. Um, we do think that, um, in general, in principle, a consumer should not be subject to restrictive business practices. Um, but we do want the European Commission and other European stakeholders to recognize the contractual and economic freedom of a merchant, meaning that a merchant can actually decide to not sell in other member states um, because of objective criteria. And also, they can differ in price and conditions because of these objective criteria. And um, <coughs> if I'm talking about objective criteria, you can think about, um, for example, age restrictions, um, alcohol, beverage. Um, you can talk about uh, lack of options in delivery uh, because of VAT reasons, because of language barriers. So you do have a huge list. Um, and this is actually justified geo-blocking. So we want, we, I think in this discussion, we need to keep that in mind. You only have to tackle unjustified practices. So when you really get blocked uh, as a consumer on a website without any legal grounds to do so for a merchant, I think that's unjustified geo blocking. So we should talk about that. And we should also think about um, the laws that are actually uh, already in place. Um, that, and then I'm talking, well, I'm, I don't want to be de too much in, uh, go into detail, but the Article 20.2 of the Service Directive is about non-discrimination. And um, it's so not uh, um, clarified. So if you clarify that and, and, and you try to better enforce, it would maybe already solve uh, the problem of unjustified geo-blocking. So if you're rerouted and you have the option to go back to the original page that you've visited, we talk about um, differentiation, and we don't want to talk about discrimination. So justified reasons to do so, an obligation to sell everywhere within Europe is just, in our opinion, not acceptable as online merchants. And you do can think about that you then have this obligation to sell maybe, and then have the freedom as a merchant to not deliver everywhere. But how would that work for consumers? So I'm buying something and I can only deliver in Germany and I'm from Belgium and then I have to pick it up there. I, I don't know how that will work also within current legislation. So that's it. Thank you very much. So what I take away from your point is um, why we heard before when the consumer might feel discriminated because he's from Spain wanting to access a Spanish product, you're saying this is not discrimination, it's, let's call it differentiation, because there is obstacles that have to become overcome before we can talk about making this uh, a single market. And, which, and that's what you don't have offline. Line. So, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, then let's go on to the next point. Um, I'm really interested in hearing about the, now let's call it a platform, the distribution part of creative content. Um, copyright, and maybe you can have a quick round on geo-blocking too, but um, I'm really interested on the, the copyright part here. Well, I, I, I have to stress out that I just can talk about audiovisual content, so mm -hmm. not really physical go goods. So no, that's, sure. that's yeah. something I'm out. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so that I, I leave that to you. Yeah. So when it comes to films and series and, and uh, things you can watch on your TV screen or on your tablet, that, that's my world. Um, 
so I do represent the, the RTL Media Group Germany, which is part of the RTL Group in Luxembourg. Um, we are one of the biggest media houses in Europe, and we own content and we produce content. So I feel in the position here today mm -hmm. to represent the creative side of the business, so to say. Um, and of course, we have our own view on a single market, um, meaning that we on the one hand think, of course, the digital world is a wonderful thing. It has a lot of opportunities, but also a lot of challenges. <coughs> um, and we have to be careful. Why? To our today's topic, where are we? What is our, our actual position? We have a very unique situation in Europe with our media industry compared to the rest of the world. Meaning, we are free, we are healthy, and we are plural and manifold. I think that's something not to forget if it comes to change something. Um, and we have additionally, and that's wonderful for people making business, an extraordinary demand for audiovisual content. So this all together makes me pretty confident for the future. And this is not what everybody, every industry can say about. So, how have we reached all this? We have reached this situation, this wonderful situation, with our existing legal framework, not to forgotten. Mm. Um, and this is not by accident. Um, let's, let, let me shortly stress out the two buzzwords of today's discussion, or well, what my assumption was, that one is, is already mentioned. What I would like to start is with, with a more positive element, that's portability. Portability, is great and due to digitalization um, of media. We think, wonderful, but is there really regulation needed? We don't think so, because <coughs> it was demand-driven. So let's do it, to make it a bit simple. Mm -hmm. Next is territor territoriali ter territoriality. Difficult world and a difficult issue. Um, if we want to change something to whatever that is, a single European market. We should be very careful that we do not destroy something we have reached as described over the last 70 years. <coughs> what I said, yep. a plural, manifold media world. And the basis as we see it for this media world is, and this might not be very popular in, in this round, is the fragmentation in Europe. The borders, that's, that's pretty yep. strange on the one hand, but on the other hand, this was the, the basis for having this plural world. And if we want to change that, we have to keep that in mind. Um, content does not fall from the sky. And the creative people have to live off something. We don't think that, that creativity comes from a real huge market, but from many markets, creative people can recoup or can make money to live, basically. Um, and that's, that's a value. The creative world we live in is a value. We should be very careful by jeopardizing this world. Thank you very much. So what I take away from your point is, well, I heard a lot about opportunities <coughs> for investment and innovation, in a sense, um, with the consumer's perspective and the seller's perspective. I hear uh, a little bit I do understand much better the pitfalls because if you enhance investment and, and um, selling goods, you might restrict the production of creative content. Um, so what I take away from your point is let's have a good look at the copyright law at hand and not jeopardize um, that and by that jeopardizing the creativity of the producers. Give them the chance to live from of their products, yeah. so whatever they have created. If you take them away from them away, markets, they just can focus on one. Yeah. And this is a critical issue. Very nice. Now, a European Commission, you heard a lot of different perspectives now, and you're supposed <laughs> to bring all of them together in while shaping the agenda. So I'm pretty excited to hear your take and your view on the um, digital single market. Yes, yes uh, thank you. So um, as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, the digital single market is one of the top priorities of the European Commission. Um, and uh, we think that um, 
we, we have created a, a single market for in the in the offline world for for goods and services, where uh, goods and services can uh, travel without restrictions uh, in the EU. And uh, there's actually no reasons uh, that uh, with with the uh, technologies that we have now, the new technologies, that this should not be the case for the online world. Um, we think that uh, a digital single market can contribute to growth and create new jobs, uh, which is uh, very important uh, for Europe at this moment. Um, and uh, that overall uh, it can create more uh, and diverse choice for consumers, but also new opportunities for, for businesses uh, to help them uh, create, uh, to, to reach new clients or to reach new audiences. Now, this being said, of course, we are aware that uh, there are many different uh, issues uh, when you look at the different uh, sectors. Um, uh, uh, online uh, platform which, which sells uh, physical goods like shoes has different, uh, uh, faces different problems than, for example, a uh, um, um, film platform. So what, what we are looking at are concrete and, and pragmatic initiatives um, according to the different uh, uh, sectors. Um, we, for example, we, we don't want to force an online platform in Italy to deliver uh, a good to Finland. But on the other hand, what, what we uh, don't want either is that the Finnish consumer would be blocked uh, to access the Italian website and, and make that order. Uh, for the um, creative content sectors, what we don't want is that the uh, online platform is forced to uh, acquire licenses for the whole of the EU. But on the other hand, we want to improve the uh, consumer access to creative content. And this is also in, in the sense of uh, uh, cultural diversity, of course. So we are planning, uh, as I said, pragmatic and, and concrete initiatives. Um, one example uh, would be what we did on, on portability in, in, in December. Portability means that a consumer who has bought a uh, creative content, a film or a song, can take this uh, creative content with him when he travels in the EU, for example, for uh, a business trip or for vacation. Um, and um, in this sense, we are, we are looking also at different options uh, for the other uh, case where the consumer uh, does not have access to a um, content uh, platform which is in another member state, but we, we want to do so without undermining uh, the, the, um, the basis for, for European content production, because we are aware, of course, that uh, this is a sector which has grown um, in, in the different countries uh, and, and its exploitation model is based on a country-by-country -country basis. So we don't want to destroy that, but we want to uh, look for possibilities to still uh, improve consumer access. So at the moment, we are in an um, evaluation process. We are assessing impacts of different uh, options, and we are, we are looking for mid of the year to um, make further proposals. Thank you very much. So what I take away from your perspective is, first of all, we first there is a, a d single market in the offline world, right? And what, which can serve as an example for the online world, except from that the offline world, we need to travel as humans to access um, cultural goods from other countries. Like if I want to see a Spanish movie, I can go to Barcelona to cinema and see a movie there. Um, or if I want to buy a product in Finland, I can go and buy it there and take it home all by myself the biggest challenge, and there is no geo-blocking, there is no copyright problem there. Um, the whole digital single market has one layer on top, which is technology does not know borders, and they are put in there artificially at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, and we have to overcome that by, well, how actually? Do we need to have a new understanding of how technology change, changes the EU? Well, I think we, we have to acknowledge that um, um, the development of technology drives uh, the development of how the consumer behave mm -hmm. uh, and of uh, the expectation of consumers and, and how uh, businesses uh, have to, to follow the, the, these expectations. 
So um, I think from the perspective of the European Commission, um, it is essential that, that we create a framework which uh, takes account of, of these developments. We cannot simply do as uh, um, th there was no Netflix or uh, as if there was no consumer who wanted to, to compare prices within the EU. Um, and uh, having said that, of course, as uh, Marlene said, uh, and, and Stefan, there, there are objective reasons why certain consumer expectations might not be uh, met. Um, you, 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 you cannot force a business to, to, to sell, uh, to, to deliver a package from, from one point of Europe to a very remote uh, region. Um, but uh, you have to look at the, uh, at the possibilities where, um, uh, where there is a business opportunity uh, and where uh, legitimately the consumer expectation can be met. Before we come back to the, the copyright and the producers and the content, I would real quick, because Malina is nodding a lot, what I'm really interested in understanding is we're now talking about today's options. Yeah, exactly. Um, technology, as we all know, is developing really, really fast and we cannot keep up with the pace. So if we discuss the the troubles of delivery, for example. If I buy a finished product in Spain, how does it get to Spain and does that face special problems at the moment that might be solved in the future? Yep. How are you taking that into account? Well, I, I think it's, it's really relevant to talk about trends and things that we actually expect that, that will come maybe sooner than, than later. Um, and what I would like to start with is that in the end, we should see the online and offline uh, commerce. I think uh, they will merge. Okay. And that's an interesting thing to take into account. So we should as, uh, also, as European um, stakeholders that are actually working on new legislation, think about frameworks that can fit both. So right now, um, we're, for example, doing something with the con con consumer contract law to make things much more easy and bring 28 different sets of rules towards maybe one. We're working on that, but still we're now working on something that is only covering online. Um, and in our opinion, you should merge that because that's the future. It's the same with the trust gap. Virtual reality will definitely bring something in terms of consumer trust because you can actually in real life see um, what you uh, are going to buy. So it, it, it's actually we're going towards a future that a consumer can shop anytime, anywhere. So be careful with coming up with too much new legislation concerning the online world. Um, but think about opportunities and yes, um, to go cross border. Um, yeah, with, uh, with, without, so think about harmonization, yes. Um, but also think about better enforcement. Actually what you said before as well. Real quick take on the consumer's perspective on, on the trends that show us today what the future is going to be like. Um, what do we have to take into account when we think the consumer's perspective? Of course, we want to be all free and use and have access to all goods and services and creative content all over the place. How do we take into account what's going to happen in future that we do not know today? First of all, I have uh, lots of replies to <laughs> some of the things. <laughs> well, go I ahead. <laughs> I just want to make sure and clear that we are not, advo in terms of copyright and creative content, we are not advocating for pan-European licensing and we are not advocating for the end of territoriality. We want the end of what they call absolute exclusive territoriality. It's like, do not block people who want to access the content because uh, this, this is uh, something that we believe that if you do it, um, it's what's the point of having all these online distribution channels and what benefits uh, can consumers take from all this if, if you don't allow these things to happen. And we do not think that this is going to bring the industry uh, to its needs or it's going to change the whole game because in, when we're talking about creative content, consumers do value their local tailored offers. It's only uh, certain consumers are going to be looking elsewhere for content. And even if they look elsewhere, that doesn't mean they're going to fully uh, pass on their, what they have already, that they're going to get rid of, on, of, on their, of their local offers. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. In terms of your question, I think that 
it's a very interesting trend that you were mentioning. And from our perspective, basically, when you start talking about these things, uh, for us, what is key is that the same rights that you have on one side, you have them on the other side, uh, meaning online, offline. It cannot be that I'm better protected if I'm going to the shop myself and buy uh, a product than if I'm buying it online. For example, if I buy now a CD from, from I still buy CDs, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> uh, from uh, uh, a shop in the corner, if there's something wrong with it, I will be able to go and, and take it back. If I buy an album on uh, some online platform and the MP3 is not working properly, it's not clear that I'm going to easily be getting refund, a refund, for example. Yep. So it's this kind of, we uh, approach all these things from a consumer protection point of view because the law is there to protect the weaker side, which is the consumer. So we just want to make sure that these things develop in a way that allows consumers to trust the digital single market yep. in, and uh, enjoy all the benefits that it can offer. Getting back to you, um, Professor Spawn, I'm... Uh, we just heard that the consumer is in a way in a weaker position, seems to be in a weaker position. The internet in the last five years seems to have been strengthening the position of the consumer. A lot, a lot of consumers are much more recognized on how markets, products and companies are shaped. Um, your point before has been that actually the producers of creative content seem to be weakened in the whole process. Um, so how do we take a copyright law, which is, as you said before, pretty strong and, and, and for good reasons, strong in Europe. How do we take that to the next age of being digital where consumers get producers and everyone wants content for free? Well, nice question for me. The ad answer should come from this side. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think... Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to, um, to add something to that. So that's... I think the weakest part in the online, the digital world, is definitely the owner or the producer of creative content. Because due to the um, technical options, as we all know, um, the content can be everywhere by a second. Yeah. Without having asked anybody, people are technically able to spread every content around the world. And this destroys not markets, but well, values and culture. Mm. So, from our perspective, and this is the, the topic of piracy, um, this is something that really jeopardizes our entire system. So when, I, when it comes to issues, when it comes to selling my channels, the RTL channels to the world, mm -hmm. I tell you what, the pirates are already there. So for me, um, to bring some money back to our creative people, creating the channels and the content of the channels it's is really pretty challenging, partly, yeah. um, because what can I sell? What is already there? And nobody is interested in to acquire these rights legally. Mm -hmm. So this is not only a problem, this is not only a problem, I don't know, far away from here. <laughs> my, my, my biggest pirates are based in Europe. So and it's pretty challenging to convert them to mm -hmm. legal. And this is, this is really frustrating on the one, one hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, another issue is, this is, is a slightly different topic coming back to you. What I found out is, we are very willing to bring the consumers our content to every corner of Europe. Our problem is, if it comes to channels, we need a platform to take our channels. And if I go to the platforms, let's say Scandinavia, nobody knows Scandinavian is, is on, on this panel at the moment, but that's quite challenging. Or give me a good reason why we are to come back to your, to, to your country, to your home country, why no, no German channel of us is distributed in Spain. That's not because of us. That's be not because of demand, by the way. That's mm. because of... Accessibility. Or that's having monopolists controlling yeah. the infrastructure and saying purely no in case we want to have some money for the content we offer because that's the money we have to put into the chain till the end um, of it, till the last uh, content producer. So I think, again, to sum up, we have two major problems. That's piracy in the online and the digital world. And this is monopoly, uh, structures of monopoly with monopolists controlling the markets. And that's, that's destroying values and culture within Europe. And this is, this is what we think we should more focus on than, 
I don't know. Yeah. Does a reindeer really need uh, RTL? Yeah, that's <laughs> that's how I see it. Well, I, uh, yes, if you I wanted if to go right away, right? Yes, uh, yeah. if I may respond to that. Um, so, of course, the, the Commission uh, looks at possibilities to enhance cross-border access because it uh, it, it considers uh, it, it's very important that the uh, that European consumers can access uh, European uh, content or, or goods from ever uh, from wherever in Europe, wherever they are, uh, in, in principle. However, we are of course aware that uh, there are many problems um, in the in the online uh, markets. Uh, that there are um, strong platforms, for example, that there is piracy. So the uh, uh, European Commission looks also at possibilities to, to find remedies for that. Concerning piracy, we are uh, currently doing a public consultation uh, on the enforcement directive with the aim of uh, making uh, progress uh, for harmonization, to make it easier for, for right owners to enforce their rights uh, wherever they are in Europe. Um, and we are also working on a um, um, industry dialogue uh, for uh, for the so-called follow the money approach. Uh, wha what do we mean with that? We we think it's important that we uh, enforce intellectual property rights uh, where the, the the root of the problem is, i.e., where where there are big uh, commercial platforms which infringe copyrights. Um, and uh, these these platforms. Uh, uh, finance themselves, for example, by advertising. So what we want to do is to to cut off the finance streams for such illegal platforms. Yeah. And then, of course, there are um, big uh, uh, online platforms which attract lots of. Uh, I'm talking here of legal platforms, uh, big platforms which attract many uh, um, users and and which engage more and more into content distribution. And here uh, we are looking into possibilities to, to see uh, how can we make uh, the, uh, the differentiation between online platforms which only serve as an intermediary and, and those who are actively doing content uh, distribution. Because we see that in, in the online markets, uh, these uh, uh, different platforms uh, or the, these, these differences merge. So we, we, we think we, we need to address also this problem. Because we're getting close to the end of, of this panel, and I, I feel like there is a lot to take um, into account that we do know today, a lot that we do not know today, since we do not know how technology changes. <coughs> we know consumers are getting in a stronger position. What do consumers actually want as, uh, as soon as they have reached that position? Um, how does content creation change over the time? Because of technology helps producing content and distributing content. On the other hand, how do we take care of the copyright part? Um, and how do we overcome the sheer fact that we might not want to overcome, that we do have borders, different cultures, different languages that we usually pretty proud of here in Europe um, when we look over to California and the US and say like, you're good at doing code, but we're really good at you know being a European Union, that means we do know how to manage um, being various, being heterogenic and so on. I would really like to know, just to take something away that we can work on in, in, in the future, from a consumer's perspective, how would the, in a perfect world, with having an America and an Asia out there, being Europeans, being proud of being different and then at the same time being proud of overcoming some distances in Europe through technology, how would a perfect digital single market look like from a consumer's pr perspective, like maybe in five years? Basically, it would be a, <clears throat> a market where you can access anything from anywhere on any device in Europe, as simple as that. If I want to buy something from Shop X in Norway, I will go and do it, and it will get delivered to me if it's possible. <laughs> if I want to watch RTL Germany while I'm traveling in Spain, I should be easily uh, it be able to do it easily as well. So it's it's about that. It's it's a, a, a digital single market for a consumer should have no borders basically. Well, same question to you, Malena. Just with a very different perspective on it. How would the perfect digital single market look like in five years? 
um, looking at, at it from an e-commerce company? Well, I think um, that we should actually overcome the biggest barriers that we face, and that is then uh, all this different legal fragmentation. Um, <clears throat> we should solve that, and I think. But I think we also, first of all, should finish the the single market. And if we, I mean, there's a huge economical untapped potential there as well. So it's both. I think. Um, um, it will help us to overcome these barriers in terms of uh, or f uh, VAT differences, the taxations. Um, it's just too complicated. So simplify things and use use actually better regulation, better enforcement to um, make sure that we, we are able to go cross border and we, we use the potential of only 15% of consumers that are actually buying in another member state. So. Um, and watch out for the US and China that are coming into Europe. Um, I, I told you before, like the expectation of 2016 is that 40% of consumers in Europe actually buy on marketplaces like eBay and Amazon, which is something uh, as an e-commerce industry in Europe to um, take into account. So hurry up. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So looking at it from a, from a content producer's perspective, how could a single digital market look like that strengthens the position of the creatives, of the producers of content again? Well, <laughs> to make it simple, I would say our market looks good. So keep our free, healthy, plural and manifold market with European players and many players as it is. Um, change what really is necessary but be very careful. So that's yeah. basically it. I think we live in a very, very good environment and we should be proud of that. Yeah. Okay, here you go, European Commission. <laughs> change everything and please don't change it. <laughs> <coughs> well, we think that um, uh, the digital single market is uh, an opportunity. It's, uh, of course, challenging, but it's, uh, in the end, an opportunity both for consumers and for businesses. Um, Concerning content, of course, it's, uh, uh, it's clear that the European content industry is, uh, is very specific. Um, uh, it's, it's different from, for example, the, the US content industry. But we, uh, we see that, uh, for example, for big US players, there is already a digital single market. And uh, we would like to, to open up possibilities uh, also for the European content industry to, to benefit from, from a bigger market uh, compared to the situation today where you have 28 uh, small markets. So when, when I started, when I heard first that I'm going to be moderating this discussion, I first thought, so what's the whole framework going to be about? People will be talking about everything's going to be good because it's EU and it's harmony here and people like each other and we're good at being manifold, as we heard before. When I then started digging into the topic, I realized it's actually pretty complicated because we, it's about growth. Um, it's about growth of businesses. There is a lot of opportunities for creating new jobs, um, for having uh, innovation. And we do feel in Europe sometimes we have a lack of innovation. That's why we always turn our eyes to California um, and, and the US because we feel they're much quicker there. So having a, a single market in the online world could enhance innovation, could help the businesses to grow from their countries to the rest of Europe to be more, to have better competition and thus helping the consumers because they, competition has always been good for the consumers and we all know um, that we travel a lot more in the world. So um, you living in Brussels, you want to see the latest homemade movie in Spanish and you cannot because you live in the wrong area um, of Europe. That's something we really feel like we want to overcome um, because in the US, no one will tell you, you live in East Coast, you're born West Coast, well, no access to that movie. Um, that's not going to happen. So the, it's about enhancing opportunities both for the consumers and the businesses and at the same time make sure that innovation only happens when there is creativity and paying too much attention to uh, what's good for the consumer might weaken the position of those that create content. And I've been a content producer myself. I, I, I've wrote a book once. And on the one hand, I feel like I really want to um, 
I want to have it translated into English, but it's so difficult. And at the other hand, people can download it in England, the PDF, they're never going to pay for it. So I feel like, okay, this, there, there my money goes. I mean, it took me time to write that book. So it's a big issue that's because of technology does not know borders, but we as humans in Europe, it's a territory. We're geographical people, we're real, uh, and we do know borders. And that means we have to learn um, to mix those two topics into one big agenda. And, um, well, good luck, and I mean it. <laughs> um, good luck, and um, going on with this discussion, it's going to be really hot this uh, early summer, right? Um, it's, there's yep. going to be more discussion about it in the European Commission, maybe. Yes. Um, this is why I want to give you the very last word on give us a little outlook on what's going to be um, discussed. You said before you're, you're doing, still doing the research, trying to understand every perspective, but maybe you can give us a quick outlook on what's going to happen on this topic next. Yeah. So, of course, there are um, two different issues. There's e-commerce and there's uh, copyright. Um, we plan um, proposals uh, for legislation mid of the year. It, it's not, uh, there's no precise date, but this, this is our assumption that, that it will work mid of the year. Um, concerning uh, copyright, we, we look, uh, as I said, at, at these, uh, let's say, two um, big issues or three. Uh, one is um, cross-border access, uh, second, further harmonization, and third, possibilities to, um, to create a fair digital single market, meaning that uh, we also have to, to uh, find new ways to combat, uh, for example, piracy. And um, what, what I would like to stress is that uh, we are in a constant dialogue uh, with the consumers, but yes, also absolutely. with uh, the industries and, and, and the content sectors. Yep. So what we will propose will, in, in any event, not come out of the blue, but it will be uh, uh, the, the product of, uh, of a pr constructive dialogue. That was a very perfect last sentence for this dialogue and this panel. I thank you very much for having been here, Philip, Stefan, Marlene and David. If you want to keep on talking to those guys, get to know more about their perspectives. I hope you'll get them at the cappuccino bar over there. Um, the time for this panel is up for now. Um, and I w wish you a very uh, good time here in Hanover at the Zebit, at the uh, Zebit Global Conference. And as I said before, if you want to discuss more, make sure you get some coffee and, um, and hold on to those people and, and ask for more expert opinion on that topic. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.